Hello, thank you for listening. Today we're looking at another reason that sets the Christian faith apart from all others. It's not only the historical resurrection of Jesus as a substitutionary sacrifice for all people, but it's the only religion that is not based upon one's good works. The Christian faith clearly teaches that all people were created for good works, but that we are not saved by them. And that's huge to understand. Salvation is procured by our faith in God's grace through Jesus' work in his death and resurrection. Another way to say it is that Jesus' work on the cross is all about grace. It is able to save the worst of sinners, but can only be appropriated by our faith in it. Episode 4 of Foundational Faith begins now. Engaging, encouraging, and enlightening. So, besides Jesus and my father who recently passed away, the most influential person in my life today who is also still alive happens to be a Mormon. And I've read many of his books, uh, which in all honesty, he's a better speaker than he is an author. And I've listened to him for probably 10 to 15 years now. Some of the reasons why, you know, I like him is that he uh, accepts responsibility and confesses where or when he got something wrong. And, you know, it shows that he's not only honest, but that he's learning and he's growing in his philosophy, in his his thoughts on everything he studies. Um, another thing that I like about him is that he he correctly and continually underscores the importance that the world's problems will not be resolved apart from a work of God in our country and within our hearts as well. Um, he really desires a personal life that is pure and he knows that a, a private and a public life are always intertwined for the better or, or the worse. So those are a few reasons why I admire this guy. <clears throat> and I heard him say a couple of years ago, I was listening to him and it was something like this. So I'm not quoting him verbatim, but it was pretty much boiled down to this. And he said that, <clears throat> you know, when he stands before God at the time of judgment, um, you know, and God kind of asked like, you know, what? What have you done? Uh, um, kind of just giving an account for his life that he's going to stand before God and he's going to say that he tried his best. Uh, he tried his best to live a good life, uh, to fight against evil, to lead others to goodness and to mercy and decency. And he's and he, that is his his hope. And he really has done a lot of that. Um, he's done a lot of good in his life, but I was saddened to hear that that was his, um, that was his answer to God, uh, when, when judgment comes and his confession <clears throat> is admirable and it's honest, but it is not Christian. And coming before God in the end days for a judgment of our life uh, is Christian. Don't get me wrong, but pointing to anything other than the grace of Jesus's death and resurrection for our redemption, for our forgiveness, our wholeness, our innocence, for our right standing before God is worldly religion. It is not found in the gospel message. So you see that this man that is influential to me that I, like I said, I admire, I admire a great bit. This man's humble and honest plea for God to consider the good that he had done compared to the wrong that he had committed is not unique just to him, nor is it unique to the Mormon faith in particular. 
but it's really indicative of all world religions that believe in a coming and divine reckoning. Even in Eastern religions that do not exactly believe in a judgment by a monotheistic God, but believe in karma and reincarnation, uh, the future life, whatever it may be, is based upon uh, based upon one's actions, good and bad. So this Mormon who really stands out as being unique uh, from your average person by his success, his boldness, his talents, his humility. He is just really like a majority of people, not by his Mormon faith, but by his belief about salvation in that he clearly sums up what all world religions and even some sects or cults of Christianity believe about salvation apart from the grace of God. And a type of salvation uh, apart from the grace of God by the work of Jesus on the cross is what is deemed in theological circles as being a works-based religion. A works-based religion. Now this belief It biblically acknowledges that one has done wrong or has chosen pleasure over denial or that we've sinned, but then it unbiblically hopes that their good works, their good choices will ultimately outweigh their bad works or their bad choices. And, you know, a a definition of a works-based religion could be probably worded with much more nuance and eloquence than that, but that is essentially what it boils down to. I hope that my good works, my good deeds, my good motives outweigh my bad ones. That's uh, a works-based religion. So, How do you feel about that? How do I feel about that? Is that true of you? Is that true of your theological house? When you stand before God, what will your hope be placed in? You and the good that you've done or in Jesus and the good that he has done for you and in you and through you. Check this out. There are 7.8 billion people in the world. And about 32% of that number are considered to be Christians. And 32% of 7.8 billion is about 2.5 billion. That means there's about 5.3 billion who are in other religions like Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and other smaller religions, or those who just aren't religious at all. And we also know that that those considered Christians in that 32% includes all sorts of Christians like Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, Protestants, and all other sects and cults from, from all of those branches. So it's safe to assume that there are a number of, you know, quote unquote Christians in that number that are still trusting in themselves Uh, as seen by my Mormon friend, as an example. So that 5.3 billion can become even larger to about, let's just say, 6 billion people. Again, considering that many labeled as Christians still need to hear the message of salvation by God's grace, by faith. 6 billion people. That is a lot of souls. And again, how many of those are preparing for the afterlife based on their good efforts or works as compared to those who are trusting in the work of Jesus on their behalf? And that's why the gospel, which means good news, is really good news because by the grace of God and the death and resurrection of Jesus and our faith in it, a real spiritual transaction happened. And the Apostle Paul said to the church in Corinth, uh, he, he summed this up 
it's one of my favorite verses. It's First Corinthians five twenty one, and he says he speaks about this transaction. He says, "For he, that's God the Father, made him." Speaking of Jesus, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's why our salvation in Jesus is called a substitutionary atonement. Because Jesus paid for our sins and our shortcomings, our, our trespasses, fill in the blank. We didn't die for our sins, nor are we responsible to somehow reverse our sins or the effects of our sin by doing good works. There was a real substitution. There was God for man, Jesus for me. And Jesus did that for me. He took the punishment of my sin upon himself so that when I stand before God in the future judgment, whenever that is and whatever that looks like, I won't have to point to the good that I've done and cross my fingers and hope that my good works have made me righteous. But the Christian message that we'll stand before God claiming no righteousness, no goodness, no hope apart from what has been given to us in Jesus. And that message of salvation is Christian. That is biblical. And so it's, it's so special and unique that it is one of the very few foundations of the Christian faith. Whether you believe in it or not is something entirely different, but the doctrine of salvation by God's grace by our, and our faith, as opposed to human effort and penance and good works, is definitely unique to the Christian faith. It stands out. So to quickly review our series of foundational faith, it's a five-part series, and we're in the fourth one now. In the first episode, we began to acknowledge that all people, religious or not, Protestant, Catholic, secular, pagan, that all of us have over time built up our own theological houses, which may or may not be built upon a solid foundation. And what is true in physical construction is also true in spiritual That if our foundation is faulty, then whatever structure we build upon it will be as well. In the second episode, we established that Jesus is the foundation of the Christian faith. And that our understanding of him, what he did, what he said, what he claimed to be, who he claimed to to be, and what he claimed to do, ultimately hinges on his death and resurrection. Uh, Was Jesus a lunatic? Was he a liar or was he the Lord that he claimed to be, as C.S. Lewis aptly put it? In our last episode, episode three, we basically went through the reasons apologetically for why having faith in the resurrection of Jesus is not uh, crazy or wishful wishful thinking, but indeed it's reasonable when considering all of the evidence the circumstances, the historical documents that we have, the history of the church, uh, not to mention the personal testimony of countless believers throughout history, as well as your own personal testimony for what Jesus has done for you. And now we've come to the question of how to apply the work of the resurrection to our lives. And uh, there are so many verses throughout the Bible that reveal this but none as clear and succinct as Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and also 10. If there's any verse uh, in the Bible to memorize, this has to be one of them. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to the church that was meeting in Ephesus in about uh, 60 AD. And he writes to the church, and in chapter 2, Uh, 
verse 8, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's something right there that we take for granted, but everyone, you know, world religions before that and world religions after that are continually saved by works. But he says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith, not works. And he says, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So it's the gift of God. It's the grace of God. Uh, uh, a simple definition of the word grace, because it can be expounded in so many different ways, but a simple acronym to remember what grace means is God's riches at Christ's expense. So for because of what Jesus did on our behalf, we now have access to the riches of God. God's riches at Christ's expense. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. He's making it very clear. This is not about you. It's not coming from yourself. It is the gift that God has given us. In verse 9, he says, Not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not of works lest anyone should boast because we tend to boast in our works. We do this on Instagram all the time, right? I I, I make a knife and I take a picture of it and I show it on Instagram and I um, am quote unquote sharing it with you, but I'm really boasting in it because I made it. I'm proud of it. So I take pride in that. So all the, all these works that we do in life, whether we're walking old ladies across the street or, uh, you know, or anything, serving our country, all these works that are, are good, we want to boast in them. And Paul says here in verse 9, this is not that. This grace that you've been given through faith is not works. It's not of yourself, because if it was, then you would boast about it. But it's not, so we shouldn't boast about it. We should be boasting in the person and the work of Christ. That's who we should boast in as Christians. So first, first, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. <clears throat> you should memorize those verses. When I was in Bible college 20 years ago, those verses were ingrained into my mind, and I memorized them. And I'm thankful that I did. But one verse I did not memorize until years later was the following verse, verse 10, which goes right with uh, verses 8 and 9. So verse 8 and 9, someone might think, well, okay, we're saved by grace, not by works. It's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. So what happens with good works? And verse 10 speaks to that. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we could do a whole podcast just on this one verse, but real quickly, for we are his workmanship. That word workmanship is uh, the word poema in the Greek. It's where we get the English word poem. We are God's poem. We're his handiwork. We're his art. Um, We are his craftsmanship. God made us. That's who we are, and we are created in Christ Jesus for a purpose. What's that purpose? For good works. Again, so we are created for good works, but we're not saved by good works. And that's a huge distinction that we have to know and believe in. So verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Good works are so important to God that he has almost preordained them in our lives that we should just walk in them. Think about that. Pray about that today. What are the good works you have that you've laid out for me just that I should walk into them? And the Bible has much to say about good works. Uh, God wants his children to be about good works. 
Jesus said in Matthew 5, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In the book of James, we read that, uh, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also, also faith apart from works is dead. In Colossians chapter 3, we read, Whatever you do, do heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews, you read that um, uh, the author says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. In Galatians Paul says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And finally, in Titus, uh, we read this. It says, uh, Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Again, we, we, the God's children, his body, He wants us to be a people who are zealous for good works. And so I read these verses because grace and good works are not opposed to each other, but they, they complement each other. And this isn't a podcast on good works. This is a, this episode is um, specifically for salvation, how we apply salvation to our life by God's grace through faith. And so we tend to think that well, what happens to good works, and I just want to highlight that good works don't go by the wayside. They complement one another. Again, what is grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. We're not going to be a people of good works if we don't first know what God's grace is. Good works flow from knowing the grace of God. It's not the other way around. So any good works that that I do in my life should not be done in effort to somehow gain God's favor or blessing, but they should be done because I already realize that his favor and blessing are already upon me by the, by his grace, by the free gift, uh, that we have to us by his son, Jesus. So to answer the foundational question to the Christian faith, how do we apply the work of the cross to our lives? It's easy. We confess our need for Jesus and our need to be forgiven. And we simply believe and trust in him. Romans 10 chapter nine says that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. John likewise says, in, in 1 John 1, 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Jesus himself said in John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. This podcast wouldn't be complete without an opportunity to place your faith in Jesus, to place your faith or even more of your faith in him and in his good work for you. This is a chance, no matter where you are in life or who you are in life, to stop trusting in yourself. First and most importantly regarding eternity, but everything else. Jesus is trustworthy for more than just your soul. He wants you to trust in him completely with your body and with your mind. Because if we're honest with ourselves and with one another, many of us like to trust in Jesus and ourselves. We like to have both. We take some amount of comfort in ourself and our efforts and our self-righteousness, our abilities, our bank accounts, our health, all those things. And if we have been trusting in those things, 
We have to know that they will fall and they will fail. So I pray that, uh, that you would commit yourself to Jesus and believe in the gospel of his grace, that you would do that today, that you would do that now. I don't think I have to persuade many people of their sin nature, our continual desire to serve and to worship ourselves as opposed to God is painfully apparent. And I believe that's true of anybody who's conscious and honest. And with COVID-19 spreading around the entire globe, we are behooved to take stock of our lives. And what a picture this is that something unseen to the human eye is powerful enough to topple the entire earth. The strength and pride of man, of humanism, the almighty self is brought low over a course of a few weeks. If there was a time to readjust your thoughts, or more accurately, your theological house, it's now. Is the foundation of your house built upon Jesus, or is it built upon your own works and your own righteousness? Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, And in the day of salvation, I helped you. God said that in the book of Isaiah. In the time, in the day of salvation, I helped you. And Paul says, and I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. And I echo Paul's plea that today is the day of salvation. Trust not in yourself or man or governments but in God so that you may be able to say for by grace I have been saved through faith and that not of myself it is the gift of God not of works lest I should boast that's my prayer for myself and for my family and my friends and for my neighbors and for anyone listening to this episode May you, Lord Jesus, save us, draw us to yourself, and may our hope and may our trust be in you alone. Amen. Thanks again for listening. I am so grateful that I have a few people out there listening. And if you found this message uh, to be useful or encouraging and you think someone else would enjoy it or even might need to hear it, Uh, please share it. Also, if you haven't yet, please rate the podcast and leave a review. Only glowing ones, though, of course. Come on. And when that happens on uh, the Apple podcast app, it changes the algorithm and it's seen by more people. So that would be great. We have our last episode on the Foundational Faith series. It will be episode five and it will be out in a week or two. And I'm also working on a series on the life of St. Patrick, which I'm looking forward to putting out soon. So good stuff coming out, and I hope you would agree. Thanks again.